Thanks, Allison, and uh, hello, everybody. If you you may know, you may not know, but I am actually sitting in Muxia, Spain. Uh, if I could turn my camera and look out the window, you would see the Camino right to my left, and on the other side of that, the Atlantic Ocean. So I'm here in the village of Muxia, just about a kilometer away from uh, the Sanctuario and the and the monument here, where the zero zero marker is. So. I bring you greetings from the Camino. Uh, if uh, any of you might have been part of uh, the July event that did not happen, I really appreciate that you might have come back and it looks like technology is our friend this morning. So I want to talk about returning from the Camino, but I want to situate that within the context of uh, my, my work in anthropology and my work on rites of initiation and rites of passage. Because the Camino to me is one of the rare and unusual true rites of passage that we have left in the West. And a, a rite of passage is just simply a moment where we um, exert ourselves in an effort to discover more about our life, our life purpose, who we are, our authenticity, etc. So pilgrimage in this way absolutely can have a spiritual component, but it also has that enlivening for our entire life. And one of the things that is true about a rite of passage is that it must have an element of failure in it. Um, so oftentimes people today are developing rites of passage that anthropologically, I would say they're not really true rites of passage because a person can't quote unquote fail. Um, in that way, it's a beautiful performance in the hope of transformation, but failure and struggle um, is an, an essential element in a true ritual of passage. And, and failure in the sense of not that we any of us can ever really quote unquote fail on the Camino, but we can have difficulties, we can have injuries, we can have things that, that happen that um, the Camino will not go quote unquote as planned. All right. So I want to talk about how we return from the Camino and I want to situate that in the context of the anthropology about a rite of initiation or a rite of passage. And also, uh, I will say that I have walked the Camino. The first time I walked the Camino was actually in 2012. It's hard for me to believe that it's now been 10 years. And since that time, I have done uh, some seven other uh, pilgrimages, pilgrimage walks on the Camino, and the most recent being this past autumn. And it was really my journey in 2012 that brought me to focus on my work. Yes, I've written a book, Returning from Camino, about how to come home. And what happened in 2012 was being the anthropologist, psychologist, I knew that reentry is a major portion of a great journey, of a pilgrimage, of quote unquote, the hero's quest. In, in fact, Joseph Campbell, who I had the great honor of being taught by when I was at the University of Notre Dame in the, in the 1970s, Campbell would talk about that reentry from the hero's journey is absolutely critical that we must make an adequate reentry. And he would say that unless there's an adequate reentry, that the whole journey may be stillborn. So in 2012, I, I had a life's work about rites of passage. I knew all the literature. I, I came to Spain with some foreknowledge that my return home was going to have trials and obstacles to it. I discovered in the wonderful group of people that I walked with that that understanding was unusual, that most people had given very little thought to 
how they would return home or to the possibility that the return home could be fraught with some trials and obstacles. So as we move through this, I'm going to show you my PowerPoint. And uh, Allison, is that up on the screen now? Thank you. Yes, it is. Thanks. Ah, go back. Oh. I have a very temperamental uh, computer today. So Joseph Campbell, along with all the anthropological research, would talk about a great journey as having four parts. And this is just a simple overview of those four parts. And on the left side, you're going to see Campbell's words. And on the right side, after the hashtag, you're, after the slash, you're going to see my words. Um, the first part of a journey is hearing the summons. Uh, the second part of the journey is enduring tests and obstacles. The third part is receiving insight or vision. And the fourth part is the return back home to integrate. Uh, my words for those four parts are facing change, trials and suffering, gift, and the final part, the return home, is to serve. Uh, just briefly, I want to talk about each of the four parts before focusing on the last. And I'm more aware that many of us um, have heard it said that the Camino has got three parts to it. First, the body, then the emotions, and third, the spiritual. As much as that's an interesting idea, it doesn't ring true to the anthropology of a great right um, because it splits us into different portions. It's like, I don't want to separate spirit from body and emotion, etc. cetera. Um, it's much, a much more holistic way of looking at a great journey and looking at the Camino is this four part metaphor that was given to us by Campbell. And Campbell came to this metaphor after 30 years of reading the world literature and distilling it down to recognizing all over the world, this is how a great journey is imagined. So the call to the journey and what I love about Campbell's work is he talked about if it's a if it's truly a deep call to a new journey, that there must be some element in us where we refuse the call or we wrestle with it or we struggle or we're not certain. He also talks about things like aid arriving by surprise. And then at some point, we make a decision, uh, at least a, a, a good enough yes, when we cross the threshold and we begin. The second part of the great journey, he will, he uses the, the metaphor from the Hebrew scriptures of the belly of the whale. And, I think that that's a really good metaphor for this second part, where we meet all kinds of trials and tests. Um, these can be emotional and physical and spiritual trials and tests. He also says oftentimes it is at this point of the journey where we meet a wisdom figure, uh, inner or outer, and we also meet uh, a tempter or a temptation. And I, for me, when I started walking, um, it was the, the uh, I, I, I remember that before I had left, somebody had said to me, Alexander, promise before you go that you will not take a bus ride. I didn't, but I really found the idea of that uh, for me in that 2012 uh, Camino, which was uh, to say rainy, uh, it was more like walking through floods uh, of mud, walking up, you know, mud swirling up your, your boots to almost your knee. Uh, and there, there, were, there were days, especially in the mud, where I thought, oh, God, it would be so wonderful to take a bus or take a train or take a cab or whatever. Um, that was the particular temptation of that year for me. The third part that Campbell talks about is that somewhere on the journey, 
there are there is a moment or there are moments where we meet uh, a numinous energy, uh, a power. Um, for me, there were a couple of times in my 2012 Camino when I had this profound sense of all is well and this sense of renewed vitality. Um, but I would say that it was not until after I was home that I was able to look back and locate when those moments happened as I walked. And then lastly, we come to the fourth part, which is the return. And again, I love this sense of Campbell talking about in a true and great rite of passage, there is the part of us that does not want the return that refuses the return and or that struggles with the return. And I'm gonna talk a, a bit more about the practicality of it, but I love that, that what's there under the star at the bottom of this slide, that for me, the, the Camino was the freedom to live in the moment. And for me, that was also the gift that I brought back and tried to integrate into my daily life. That uh, love of walking with just a few things on my back, the simplicity of the day. And that, it, and that was the gift to me in that 2012 Camino that in small and large ways, totally reshaped my life. And it is one of Campbell's great aphorisms or wisdom sayings about the, about the rite of passage is that it prepares us for the freedom to live in the moment. Okay. So let's talk about this return. Um, in 2012, so many of the people that I walked with went home and were paralyzed. Um, one of my friends literally went to bed for about three months uh, and sort of hid under the covers. Uh, another spiraled down into a, an utter sense of futility about what had this been, and I've come back to my ordinary life and nothing has changed. And people had the return experience be everything from uh, a subtle unease with life to I would even say a dramatic paralysis. So here are the things that we can build into our walking. And for me, what I talk so much about in, in, in my book, Returning from Camino, is that we really start the return at the very moment we decide to walk. Because knowing how you want to come home also is going to be a lot of how you prepare to leave. So for me, I knew that I wanted I knew that I was going to discover something on the Camino that I was going to have to bring home and make a thousand choices about. I knew that as a rite of passage, that the Camino was not going to be a magic bullet, that I wasn't going to go on the Camino and I was not going to magically change my life or change my heart. What's more true is what happens on the Camino as we walk awakens us. And that's the first movement in transformation, but it's only the first movement. So that when I come home, life is going to rush at me. And in that moment and in the moments, those weeks and months after I'm back from walking, I've got to remember that I want to make new choices, that there's nothing that's going to happen on the Camino 
that is going to take away the power when I'm back home to make new choices. And those choices probably are going to be somewhat difficult. Largely, one of the things is because when we are back home, our friends and our family may not be our best support for the hundred new decisions that we want to make or the 10 new decisions or the two new decisions. Unless someone has gone through a process of change and growth, um, if you come back and begin to want to enflesh and embody a new way of being, those around you will, will usually be resistant to that. They might be passively resistant or actively resistant. Why does that happen? Because if you are changing, gosh, there might be something in my life that I'm being called to change, and I don't know whether I want to face that. You, you have faced in to beginning a growth process. And many of and many of our friends are in their wonderful but habitual life. And when you begin to act in new ways and to have new thoughts, it can be quite unsettling. So one of the things about this is not to fight them, not to argue with them, uh, seek out, and this is where all of our chapters are, are, are such gold mines of support, seek out those people who have had a like experience, who know how to affirm the experience that you've had, and also perhaps affirm the new decisions that you are working to make. So that if you have your closest friends, if you have your spouse, if you have your family, and they are not understanding you, and this can often be a usual experience, don't have an expectation that they should understand you. They have not gone. They have not walked. They have, had, they have no concept of what you truly have done. I remember for myself, uh, one of my dearest uh, people in my family, when I came back to the States after having walked in 2012, I, I arrived back in the States the day before US Thanksgiving. And we're sitting down at the Thanksgiving Day table and um, somebody asked me to talk about what I had just done. And um, one person at table was absolutely certain that I could not have gone to Spain and done this, that certainly I had gone to Spain, I had gone to a resort for a month and come back with all these made up stories. Um, another person at the table was like, oh, you can read about that on Google. Uh, there was there was this wall of silence that I met. Now, I hope that you haven't had an experience like that. But often, but that's not an unusual experience for many of us when we come back, that the people who really want to hear the story of what we have experienced are usually the, the few jewels in our life and not the large crowd. So that in my work with pilgrims right before they go home, I often invite them to develop a series of stories. You know, there are going to be those people who want the travel log. There are going to be those people who want the food review. There are going to be those people who want the, uh, the, the museum tour. Uh, have those stories ready. They're going to be those special ones who want to hear the true deeper story protect that story for those people because in a, in an ongoing process of change and growth people will try sometimes to take your truth away from you by uh, objecting or trying to remove the story from you so just know that not everybody when you come home, 
wants to truly hear or is able to truly hear the, the depth of the Camino. So other things about on the way home, I like to remember that there's no place in Spain which is our destination. Um, we do not go on the Camino to arrive at any place in Spain. We go on the Camino to arrive back home. And perhaps you, perhaps your walking day stopped in Leon. Perhaps they stopped in Sadia. Perhaps they stopped in Santiago. Perhaps they stopped here at the Atlantic. That's not your destination. That's simply your turnaround place. And language here is really important for us to remember that the Camino is from home and to home. And though most of us are not going to walk on our way home, it is still the Camino. When you get on that bus, when you get on that train, and especially when you get on that plane, and when you get off of it, you are still on the Camino. You may not be walking, but interiorly, you are still on the Camino. And so we also need to prepare for the decompression from our walking days and prepare for how we're going to have spent so many days going at three to four miles an hour. And suddenly, we're going to be in public transportation, or we're going to be back in the States where life is lived at at least 55 miles an hour. That has a shock effect on us. Be aware of the shock effect. There's, there's really not much way to not be shocked, but if you are prepared for the shock, you won't be paralyzed by the shock. The other part is to not have an expectation on yourself that you know what all of this was about. And remember um, when I set off, my, my first day is I left St. Jean and I'm, I'm, I'm heading up to to Orasan and, and then eventually to Rancavalle. And I'm meeting different people on the way. And, and the most common conversation that day after where, where are you from was, why are you walking? And, and there was this one lovely person who was in tears because she hadn't figured it out yet. Um, I didn't have any expectation. And it's, I think, a a, a great relief to stop asking myself to have an expectation about, I know why I'm doing this. I feel called and at some point I'll figure it out. But uh, after a while in 2012, I just started having fun making up a different story every day, knowing that all of them had an element of truth, but did I really know why I was walking? No. And I didn't really know why I walked for months after I was back home. Allow yourself to be in the moment and to not know. It's the greatest gift to learn to live in the freedom of the moment, which means to not know. And then to begin to discover who you are. One of the most incredible things about the Camino, and um, I probably took this a little bit to the extreme for myself in 2012, but I had just had a book published and my publisher had sent me around the states, around the world, talking about this book, etc. And there was this author persona that had become a very heavy um, beam on my neck. So I didn't want to tell people my name, much less what I did. So I made up a name for myself because I didn't want anybody Googling to see who this guy was. I just wanted to be 
me. And I didn't even know who me was anymore. So the last thing I wanted to do was to be telling all the stories of quote unquote life back home. And what happened for me through the Camino and then bringing that energy back home at the end was I eventually discovered a very different person than the person who had set out. Over and over again, one of my sayings is we don't really change on the Camino. We awaken. And awakening is a critically important thing to do. But remembering that the Camino awakens us rather than changes us puts the emphasis on, I bring the Camino with me when I come home. And then the deeper work begins. Because now that I'm back into my ordinary life, now is when I'm going to see things differently. Now is when I'm going to perhaps feel things differently. I discovered in 2012, after I was home, that many of the activities that I had given so much of my energy to, I didn't care about them anymore. They had totally lost their allure. And I had to go find out what I had passion for now. But again, I was expecting that the Camino, and the way that I really prefer to to think about this, and the Joseph Campbell would talk about it in the same way, is that this process creates a new reservoir of energy in us. The energy doesn't really have an answer, but we come home with that energy and we discover where the energy directs us. And we discover new passions, new places of activity, and what I would say is new gifts, or we have old gifts reaffirmed. Oh. You'll also see there the thought about allow yourself months, not days, months, maybe years, to let the energy of the Camino settle you and mature you into something quite new and vital. Um, with the pilgrims that I work with on the way home, um, I want to slow everything down, i.e. I really suggest that when they stop walking somewhere in Spain, wherever they stop walking, um, take a week, two weeks, more, just to be, just to collect themselves and prepare themselves for the shock of returning home largely to the States or to some very, uh, um, usually it's UK, Ireland, States, Canada, um, highly uh, industrial and technological societies that move very quickly. The other thing is we know that smell is one of the things that most keep us in an experience. And so when you arrive home, don't unpack and wash your clothes that you wore on the Camino and put them away. Keep wearing them. Let the smell and the feel of the Camino remind you that even though you're back home, you are actually still walking. Truly, 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 this is why I really encourage everyone to change their language of, of a destination anywhere in Spain. The destination is at the end of the second half of the Camino, which is your home. And even when you physically arrive in the place that you departed from, 
it may be months and months and months before you discover the true new home that you have returned to. So <clears throat> not packing all the, not packing the credential away, not packing the shell away, not uh, unpacking the bag and putting it away, not unpacking the clothes and cleaning them and packing them away, but uh, put that rag somewhere in your living space. Wear those clothes for a while. Don't return to your usual clothes just yet. In every way, remember this wasn't a holiday. This was a pilgrimage and that you're still in it and help others to understand that you're still in it and gradually, gradually, gradually begin to, the word I want to use is detrance because there is a way that the Camino takes us into a reality which is so different from our usual reality. And you want to gradually bring that reality home and make it in some ways a part of your everyday life. The other thing about the coming home experience is to those people, those brilliant jewel friends, uh, is to tell the story of the Camino to them and to keep telling it. And if these people are really good listeners, they are going to help you understand how you're telling the story over time a little bit differently. And the way that you begin to tell the story differently is a key to what you've brought home. And it's probably a key to the gift and to the new choices that you want to make. And so over time, you will slowly, by telling the story, by honoring the story, the deep story, the real story, the gritty story, you'll begin to live in to this more vital person that I think probably you left on this pilgrimage to become. In the, the last thing is I, I um, well, I mean, I'm going to go one more slide here. Again, this is Joseph Campbell, who kept saying that the ultimate aim of the journey, if one is to return, must be neither release nor ecstasy for oneself, but the wisdom and the power to serve others. Now, I would say that that service begins first by the service to being your better authentic self. And then secondly, to offer something of what you have discovered about your own authenticity to others. It may be serving the Camino, it may be serving your fellow pilgrims, it may be serving your chapter. Yes, it may be coming to Spain and being a hospitalier. But if this was not holiday alone, the Camino has given you a gift that will only truly serve you when you serve that gift to another or to others. Therefore, the Camino is a circle about what I receive, I share. And in that sharing, I continue to receive. Um, I love this somewhere written on the Camino. I came across this sign one day. That's a copy of my, that's a, the face cover of my book. But uh, somewhere, I, it was somewhere actually on the Mazetta. Uh, our steps end, but does the journey true our steps end but does the journey i hope that you will take the message to many 
that there's no destination in Spain. And that when you get on transportation to at home, that's the second half of the Camino. And it's actually the longest half and in some ways can be the most lonely because we don't have our friends around us. We don't hear the sound of this, our trekking poles. We don't have the shell bouncing on our back. We don't have the name of Pilgrim. And yet, we are on the most important part of the journey if it is truly going to serve us being a vital, authentic self. This is uh, my most favorite quote from Joseph Campbell, and I'll, I'll end this portion and we can love to hear your experiences and, and, and your questions. Campbell says this uh, about the hero heroine's journey, and I think of it as very true for me of my Camino. We have not even to risk the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. By that, he meant the four paths that he's laid out. We have only to follow the thread of the hero's path. And where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a God. And where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. And where we had thought to travel outwards, we shall come to the center of our own existence. And where we had thought to be alone, we shall be with all the world. Thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. We had a lot of positive comments and thank yous for the content and people agreeing with what you were saying. Um, we also had someone who said that your work um, reminded them of the work of Gregory Bates as well as an anthropologist. Um, the first question that came was, uh, we have folks who return to the Camino again and, get, and again. How does, how does that relate to what you've been describing? Um, as someone who has returned to the Camino again and again and again, um, I, I think that there, there are many ways to integrate the experience of the Camino. And I would really, and I can only answer this for myself. Um, my first Camino walk was in 2012, and I really think of it as still sort of the, the, the great walk of my life. And that I walked again in 2015, 2016, and 2017. And those three years integrated uh, and helped me uh, deeply affirm what I had discovered in my first walk. And I would really say that, that my Camino sort of ended for myself in that I really felt like I had sort of integrated what opened up and what I became aware of in that 2012 walk by the end of my walk in 2017. I don't wanna suggest that that's anyone else's truth, um, but for me it was, I, I really, I needed to keep coming back to this place and retouching the well and reaffirming and reintegrating what had really begun in 2012. And along those lines, the next question is, how do we keep the spirit of the Camino if we don't have people around to understand this journey? It's hard. Um, Uh, I'm hoping that you have chapters um, near you, uh, but here's what I do. Um, I take my bag 
I put it up in my bedroom. I actually have a little um, sort of a Camino shrine. Uh, not that I want to adore the Camino, but I want it's it's it, I'm wearing the sweater today that I wore many, many, many days on the Camino. Um, when I put this sweater on, I remember I remember all the friends that I walked with on, on those days. I remembered the smell of the food. I remember the weather. Um, I also take out. I, uh, you know, for me, my credential um, is even more important to me than my Compostela. And um, feeling this, smelling it, uh, remembering, looking at the stamps, uh, opening up my journal, uh, watching Camino movies and videos. Uh, and my hope would, especially in the days of Zoom, that we can find one or two pilgrims wherever they are. I mean, I came back to the States and my Camino brother was in Wales. And um, we started with long distance phone calls. Today, it's easier to do Zoom sessions. Uh, we're 10 years now. And just when I'm on the phone with him, it's like a day has not gone by since we said goodbye in 2012. I hope that there's something in that that might help you. But what I really want to say is you're not alone. Alexander, we had a request that you go back to slide nine for just a second. Thank you. And then we had someone who said they're starting their first Camino in April, but as a backpacker of trails in the Southern Appalachians, uh, the person recognizes some aspects of what you said, but it may be different in that this is an activity that I periodically return to rather than one big transformation and return. I find that it's changed how I think of myself and how I go about my regular activities. Your thoughts? Yes. Um, one of the things that uh, Campbell's work and then my own is when we look at these four paths, um, the four part quote unquote hero's journey, uh, a, a true rite of passage is not about the rite of passage alone. It's about teaching us the cycle of what we go through over and over and over and over and over throughout our whole life. So the idea of these four paths, four parts of the journey or the four paths is not something I do when I'm walking in Spain. It's like when I walk in Spain, I get to see them um, magnified, which helps me identify them in my everyday life, wherever I am over and over again. And sometimes in one day, we will cycle through all four parts of the journey. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, I do want to open it up if folks want to ask questions or if I skipped your question on accident, I do apologize. Um, but I do want to open it up if some folks want to ask questions. And while I'm waiting on that, um, Alexander, would you mind stop screen sharing so that folks can see a bigger picture of you? <laughs> uh, certainly. And Harriet, I see your hand up, so you're up first. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for everything you've said here. It's it's just so lovely. Um, I had I had two thoughts. Uh, I walked the Camino de Santiago of uh, uh, Frances. Um, Dur uh, the fall of 2019, so right before uh, the pandemic began, and I found that the the having walked the Camino gave me two big opportunities uh, that uh, ended up uh, unfolding during the pandemic. One was initially I found that I think because of the Camino experience, I could en endure maybe or experience the pandemic. In a, 
and at a much higher level than I ever would have before. Um, and the other part, the part two of that, and there's a lot of details, but the, the part two of that is that also the pandemic gave me an opportunity to absorb the Camino experience in a way that I never would have been able to had I had all the normal distractions of life. So I just thought, I just wanted to get any comments about that. Um, just, I mean, you've just beautifully illustrated what I think of in terms of that second path uh, on the great journey is about enduring all the trials and obstacles and learning that they have a meaning and also learning that I can endure them. And maybe that's that experience on the Camino became something that you brought home and lived again through the pandemic. That was exactly my experience because I um, I went on a short Camino, but I did that because I wanted to do some more traveling, which was part of my Camino was traveling alone. And um, I was being pulled by my family to come home because I was there uh, March of 2020. And everybody in the United States was really living in fear. And, um, and I was not because it was a different feeling in Portugal and Spain. But when I did come home, you know, initially I was hurt because people weren't asking about my trip. Everybody was so preoccupied with what was going on and being safe and how we, how we were going to live with this uh, illness. And um, I came to realize that the transition back home was made easier for me because there was very little social contact. I had to isolate for at least two weeks. Um, I was working in my yard and cooking meals and taking, you know, wearing the same clothes and the same simple pair of earrings that I'd worn for the month that I'd been gone. And um, so the transition back home, I think, was made easier for me by all of that. And um, I'm still now processing. It's only in the last few months that I've joined some of these groups and um, started again processing all of that. So I held it inside for all that time because everybody was busy thinking and talking about other things. So anyway. It, this is very helpful. I really put it in perspective. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. And yes. Carol, did you have a question? Yes, I, but not really a question. I just wanted to, um, well, maybe there is a question in it. I've walked the Camino three times. The first time from Saint-Jean, the second time from Burgos, and the third time I met my brother in Lyon. And I put in an application to be a hospitalero in one of the ho hostels, but I've not um, heard anything back. And I'm wondering when I might hear, because I would love to be a hospitalero and you know, encourage people because as I said, I've done it three times or uh, would love to yeah, do it yeah. again. Thank you, Carol. I, love to do it again. I, I don't know that timeline. Steve, do you have a potential update for Carol? Well, Carol, you've been trained as a hospitalera? No, that's what I'm trying to do. I want oh, to. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, to, to you, work you in the hostel. Yeah, right. You're 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 a member of American Pilgrims. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you'll be getting notices uh, about when the, the workshops are going to be, the training sessions. The first requirement is you have to go through the training session, and we, that's we haven't had we haven't had those since um, the pandemic uh, started. The first one is going to be at the gathering. Um, next month it's already full but there's going to be another one in the summer another one in the fall well i want so to just, be on i'm going to be on the camino in the summer yeah well so that's uh, not very helpful yeah well we we work with the the spanish associations that, that there are other these are the donativos they're private uh uh albergues that also uh mm. take hospital uh, hospitaleras um john uh, alexander maybe you know being over there, how, how to contact those? But we we work with the donativos, and they require that our the hospitaleros uh, receive the, the training that, that they put together. So and that's already full. You said, yeah, uh, no, that's too bad. Yeah. Okay. So Carol, I did put the link to the training in the in the chat, and so as there are additional trainings that come up. Uh, they'll be posted there. And also, I believe they go out to email, excuse me, they're emailed to our members as well. 
Okay. And what what is the chat? Do I have the email address or if It'll if you want on... it's in the chat. If you look on your computer screen down at the bottom, there'll be a little chat icon. You okay. can also email board at AmericanPilgrims.org and we'll get back to you with the details of the also, link. Also, Carol, if you look on, on the American Pilgrims website, there are other volunteer opportunities that are listed there with links. Oh, great. So you might check that out. You know, you could work okay. it, you could volunteer uh in the pilgrim's office or a number or the saint jean there are a number of different ways beyond being hospitalera so okay okay great because i do want to go back in the summer and walk again. wonderful thank you carol anthony well, i see your hand up yeah i just uh uh i i did the camino in 2019 agree transformational um you can see here alexander i still you talk about this this is not on my wall but this is from Majorin, which you talk about your experiences. I guess I had a I had a strong one there. This this is great. I can tell you when I came back, I thought about writing stuff about this, but unless you've done this, I I don't think you understand it. And sometimes when people talk about this, I feel like maybe I'm being selfish talking about it. Maybe I'm being because they just don't understand. And these meetings help reinforce that feeling that I had in 2019. I see Martha's here. We we have a we have a uh, we have a group up in Asheville that we meet that does this. Um, and I think that there's an element this, of this that push doesn't work. Like you say, people listen and they go, yeah, okay. But pull works. People who want this. I have a student, there's a student at Vanderbilt, there's one at UNC who's, and I'm not pushing it, but they're pulling from me. I just got an email from a friend at the Y who's, they're gonna bike it and they wanna talk. Is the opportunities are there and it helps reinforce, it really reinforces the, the, the experience that, uh, that I'm sure if you've been, that everyone has had, and if you haven't been, that I hope you do have. Um, so that's just, just a comment, and, and thank you very much for these. These are my second or third one of these, and uh, they've been very, uh, they've been helped this coming back thing. And can you put the name of your book up there, the book you had again, please? Anthony, is that a question for me? Yeah, whatever, the, there was a book about the return. Yeah, uh, simply called Returning from Camino. Okay, thank you. And it's in uh, German, uh, Spanish, and English. I do have a question, um, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I'm going to do the Camino in April, and I'm thinking maybe Alexander might be able to answer this, but maybe somebody else. Um, I've been told that like a lot of the pilgrim meals and the kitchens and that have been closed because of COVID. And part of my excitement of being over there is actually sharing pilgrim meals with people from all around the world and meeting them. Um, has it changed a lot since before COVID to now where some of that experience might not be the same? Um, that the experience is not gonna be the same as 2019, yes. And it's gonna be a rich experience. I walked in 2021, um, it's different and it's, and it's wonderful. But it, I mean, there's, and, and we don't exactly know what it's gonna be like this year, um, but there are, you know, needing to to space out a bit more the table um needing to space out more the beds and the albergues etc it's very doable and you're going to find your way and you're going to find incredible people to talk with okay thank you that was oh, a great better. talk by the way great presentation thank you thank you can i make a comment sure um, my Camino seems to have involved a lot of uh, detours because of uh, surgeries and whatnot. I've been planning since about 2016, but will not be going until April 19th this year. Um, it ju I just want to make the comment that, um, how do I put this? I'm a pastor, retired. And one of the things I'm discovering is that there's an element of translation 
involved in talking about one's experiences. Um, a lot of what has been said, um, Alexander, um, I can think of, oh, that's maybe what Thomas Merton meant when he explained this or wrote about this or some other, um, you know, spiritual churchy, you know, related um, material. Um, so now I'm playing around with that. You know, what does that mean even um, to translate? And that sometimes some others understand or key into something if I can ex translate it into words that make sense to them. One of the things that surprised me and delighted me when my book came out was I started to hear from veterans who were picking this book up and saying, I needed to hear this coming back to the States military service. And then I started to hear about missionaries coming back to the States after serving in third world countries. And then I started to hear from grief chaplains. Um, this material is not particular to the Camino. It's written as if it is, but it's a general human experience. And what I would say is, especially if you feel isolated from other pilgrims, I bet there's some people around you who have some similar experiences, maybe not the Camino, but you're going to be talking the same language. With that, I would like to say thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Alexander, we had someone in the chat who said that uh, Michael, who met you at Flores del Camino in 2019, they were staying at a, an albergue and they just wanted to say thank you and getting to speak with you at that dinner and then learning about your, their, your book helped enrich their Camino experience. So um, with that, I wanna say a huge thank you to Alexander for speaking with us today. I think um, the, the positive idea of thinking ahead to your Caminos and, and planning and the idea of just that thoughtful nature was just what we needed this morning. And so I just really appreciate you all taking the time to attend and Alexander, the gift of your ideas and speaking to us today. Um, I do want to say as a reminder, this video will be posted in about one to three weeks on the American Pilgrims on the Camino uh, YouTube channel. So please subscribe to that and you'll be able to um, see lots of great talks there. Uh, also, I wanted to just put in a bit of a plug. I know some of you are looking for ways to connect with Pilgrims. We have chapters across the U.S., so um, that's available on our website as well. And also we'll have another uh, national event like this available to Pilgrim or to American Pilgrim members in March. And it's gonna have a bit of a different format. Um, we're gonna have the, the group come together, share experiences and uh, break into smaller groups to ask questions and share ideas and things like that. So it's gonna be a bit of a different format. So I really hope that you come with uh, questions and ideas. And um, again, I thank you for sharing your morning with us and I say Buen Camino. Camino.